Greetings to everyone. Bienvenue à tout le monde. Good morning, good evening in Sri Lanka. I'm Shauna Van Praag, a professor of law at McGill and this year's Annie McDonald Langstaff Workshop Series Coordinator. And it's a real honor to welcome all of you to Montreal, to McGill, to our Faculty of Law and to our Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. As you may have uh, seen, we have um, muted everybody to start and the session is recording. Um, and please, of course, feel free to turn on your video um, if you uh, uh, feel comfortable doing so, because uh, it's always nice um, for speakers to feel that the room is filled. The session today is both the second in a, the series of Annie McDonald Langstaff workshops this year, and it also serves as this year's Patricia Allen Memorial Lecture. You will hear more about the lecture in a few moments, but I will start with a reminder of Annie McDonald Langstaff for whom the workshop series started in 1988 is named. Annie McDonald Langstaff was the first woman to earn a law degree in Quebec. She did so as a single mother and she graduated from McGill in 1914 with first class honors. Not permitted to write her exams for the Quebec Bar, she worked as a legal assistant for over six decades and continued to fight for equality, especially with respect to women's right to vote. And eventually, in 1941, women did gain admission to the bar. Annie McDonald Langstaff herself was posthumously admitted in 2006 and awarded the Medal of Honor from the Barreau de Québec. As was the case last year, McGill's Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism is the generous co-sponsor of the faculty's Annie McDonald Langstaff workshops. I am absolutely delighted about this collaboration and am grateful to the center's directors, Nandini Ramanujam and Frédéric Maigret. In particular, I want to signal thanks to Sharon Webb at the center and to Elise Mallette, a fourth year law student assistant, both of whom have provided remarkable support. The invitations to all of our speakers, both last year and this, are grounded in connections between the guests and members of the center. And this brings me to the unique format of the workshops. Organized this year around the general theme of mothers-in-law intergenerational dialogues on women and human rights, um, after last year's theme, leading the change, the potential and power of women in law, they take the form of dialogues with women doctoral students at McGill's Faculty of Law who come from around the world. And today's dialogue is organized under the sub-theme of confronting violence. It is of course intentional on my part that I have not yet mentioned the name of our guest, a jurist and human rights leader who knows our faculty and our Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism very well. That of course, uh, as I say, is intentional. I have left that honor to our two doctoral students for today, Vishaka Vijinayaki and Luisa Castaneda Quintana, who will engage her in dialogue for a little under an hour, leaving time for exchange with members of the audience. Bienvenue, welcome over to Vishaka and Luisa. Thank you, Professor Van Prague. Before we move on to introduce um, our guest speaker, I would like to uh, give a brief introduction to today's session, which is devoted to Patricia Allen Memorial Lecture. Um, this lecture was originally created in 1992 by the class of 88 in memory of Patricia Allen, another McGill Law alumna, just like Annie McDonald Langstaff and most of us, um, who was tragically murdered by her former husband. This annual lectureship aims to inform and educate the legal profession as well as other communities about pressing social and legal issues related to violence, but especially violence against women. In recognition of this, today's lecture will be titled Confronting Violence. And now I pass our virtual floor to my colleague Luisa to present our guest speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Vishanka, and good morning. And evening to all of you. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Rodika Kumaraswamy. Uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy has an extended experience working on human rights, social justice, and gender uh, equality. She is a lawyer, diplomat, and human rights advocate from Sri Lanka. Dr. Rodika served as the chairperson of the Sri Lanka Human Rights Commission. She was the first special rapporteur on violence against women. She was the lead author of a global study on the implementation 
of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 of Women, Peace and Security. And more recently, she was appointed as a member of the Inter Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar, established by the U United Nations Human Rights Council. But very importantly, for our faculty in 2005, the McGill Faculty of Law recognized her with the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism Litva Award. It is a real pleasure uh, to have you with us today, Dr. Rodika, and to have the opportunity to talk to you about issues that are at the center of debates. Um, I'm gonna go uh, with the first uh, questions. And today, uh, we would like to start with a personal question that is very related to your experience as a woman working on human rights and gender and in an international um, environment, Dr. Rodica. Um, certainly, uh, through the position you have occupied, you have been able to positively impact uh, other people. Uh, however, when we talk about our work, we usually talk about others, other women, but us, we usually talk about the experiences of others. And that is why today, uh, based on your own experience, we would like to, to ask you if you have had to overcome challenges related to gender-based discrimination or exclusion. And if you believe that uh, your personal experience have impacted you to take on women's uh, rights. The floor is yours, Dr. Ruth. Thank you very much for inviting me. And, uh, and I, I would like to have this to be an interesting, but also a fun discussion, because a lot of the things that happens to us, makes all of us of a particular age, as well as a, a particular gender, um, you will recognize a lot of what I say in your own lives, I'm quite sure. I mean, in the sense that I, you must remember that I started my career 40, about 40 years ago. Uh, uh, and, you know, just, uh, just to begin with an anecdote, uh, I was admitted into the BA class of Yale University, and they had just started admitting women in the second year. And the women, except for a few of us that were kept separate, but the, most of the women were kept in one hall uh, and they were surrounded by security. By evening, there was a whole demonstration brewing of all these sportsmen. And they had these signs that said, if you have to admit women to Yale, why this ugly bunch? So that was the level at which we were greeted uh, at Yale University in 1971. Uh, I don't think they'll do it again now. Now I went to Yale and Yale, had, the majority of people at Yale are uh, uh, women, 51% women. Uh, and therefore um, they're not, they're quite clueless as to the type of things we had to go through. The other thing we had to go through was never find a toilet. Uh, this institution was built only for men and the toilets were built for their wives or girlfriends that might visit. So there were no, no really running around constantly in search of toilets. That's one thing uh, when you, we write the history of the world, there must be a paper on searching for the toilet. Uh, even in the UN, when you go to Geneva, um, you know, the major scale that um, things, divisions that had to be done as women came more and more into the world. So it, we were, it was a very basic life 40 years ago, fighting very, for very basic ways of being. Um, and um, uh, law schools were, I, we were 240 women in a class of 1,200 uh, in the law school, in the, uh, in the undergraduate law school was also just 10% women. So we were always a minority, always uh, not exactly in the, uh, in, in, in the, um, dominant position, but we, we continued with that. Um, I experienced sexual harassment and I will confess that quite often, but it was so normalized that I really did not 
see it as an issue. And I sometimes only when things were uh, today articulated, do I realize that I was actually a victim. It's very interesting. Well, we took it so much as a normalized process of male-female uh, relations. You know, you, you would of course brush it aside, but it, it, would, it would not pain you to challenge or to push, etc. So I must admit that I was one of those women who did not challenge sexual harassment uh, and just brushed it aside. Now, when I think back, I think I should have. Um, then also the cultures of institutions in those early year, years, you know, all the men would be in boys clubs or uh, boys institutions, they play golf, they socialize together. When you're in a meeting, they're talking over your head. You try to talk, they talk to each other. Uh, then you should have to raise your voice to be heard. And all those kinds of talking dynamics was also a very big part of, uh, of, of, of being in, in working with men. And also the thing is that when you did, when you were a woman in these institutions, you found yourself drifting toward topics that were like women and children. That's what happened to me. I went to the UN and it's natural, it seemed that I would end up talking about violence against women and children. Now, maybe in the next incarnation, I would want to do peacekeeping or uh, nuclear, uh, but you know, there's something always in the early, in these early years where the subjects assigned were usually linked to what women usually do and talk about. Um, so I would say that in those early years, we were very, uh, uh, we were very, just because there were not enough voices to have your point of view heard, you had to be strident. So you, uh, developed also a personality reputation of being difficult and strident, most women who did well uh, in that sphere. Now, the one thing that I didn't have to suffer in the gender-based discrimination, because I'm not married, didn't have children, is how to deal with the dual burden. That I think is the single most thing affecting women who work. Uh, my, many of my friends who passed out with me Many of them gave up or, or decided they'd just settle for a lesser paying job so they can manage family and the home. And we really haven't solved that problem at all. Uh, whether we're providing state services, whether we're providing private services, tax cuts, really not addressed our issue to this. In the 1990s, we posited maternity as a social issue. Uh, and that, uh, what, uh, but that whole way of thinking has also now gone away. Recent revivals, uh, but not really still uh, taking to the fore. Though, though these paid leave arguments in the U.S. at the moment may have something to do with that as well. So, so those were uh, gender discrimination uh, relating to maternity uh, were also things that were there, but which of course didn't affect me because I was not married. But so we, we faced that generation in the 19, uh, let's see, when I came in, I, I would have come in, in in the 70s and 80s. So basic gender discrimination was the classic one, sexual harassment, not, uh, dealing with uh, cultural aspects of the workplace. Um, and um, generally uh, having to, deal with the environment of which that workplace is. And of course, the whole issue of promotions and all those that take place as well is something that also there was a lot of discrimination in. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumaraswamy. And you spoke about how it was difficult to be the first group of women to be at Yale. Um, the law school, uh, no, the BA. And um, I was, when I was reading about the life of Annie McDonald Langstaff, she faced similar challenges in attempting to be a lawyer in Montreal, being the first one. And what I realized is that um, being the first person to fill a position of responsibility or trying to achieve something that others haven't achieved is daunting. 
But on the other side, it also means that you get the opportunity to envision the contours of your role um, and to set an example for those who follow you. And as Louisa mentioned, you were the first um, United Nations Special Rapporteur for Violence Against Women. And in this capacity, you took on a Herculean task of setting out the historical and cultural causes of violence against women, as well as the consequences affecting different spheres of life. So given the magnitude of this issue, um, I would like to know uh, what were the goals that you set for yourself in setting out to fulfill your mandate? And also considering that institution of the Special Rapporteur usually to a great extent depends on the willingness of governments to cooperate with you. Um, what were the strategies that you adopted to have a higher impact on those on, on the field and on the ground? Yes. Well, let me say that, um, you know, we all take violence for women now so, uh, so, so much for granted as a topic area for women. But until really the 1990s, it was a um, prohibited taboo area of discussion. When CEDO was written, as you know, violence against women was not mentioned. CEDO has no provisions with regard to violence against women. And um, so it was in the 1990s, and this was really due to an international movement coming bottom up to the United Nations. It began with um, groups in Latin America fighting honor killings, um, groups in India filing dowry debts. Those were the kinds of issues they were facing. Groups in Southeast Asia fighting trafficking of women. Groups in South Africa fighting issues of rape. Uh, and then in, in Europe and, uh, and uh, North America, both rape and domestic violence cases. Yeah, of Eastern Europe, again, uh, trafficking. And of course, in all the armed conflict areas. So there was so much violence against women. So there was certain theorists like Charlotte Bunch and others who took all these different aspects of violence and brought it under a, that such violence is a violation of women's human rights. Um, so the theory, the conceptual theory that came forward was violence against women is a, is a violation of women's human rights. And using that framework, it came in in the 1994 at the World Conference on Human Rights. Uh, as, as a way forward. Um, and uh, it had enormous political backing. Within a year, there was a, a declaration on the elimination of violence against women, which was quite state of the art declaration. And they created a post uh, for a uh, special rapporteur on violence against women at the, uh, at the commission. So then the issue came, have, having this, uh, there was the devil, the, 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 uh, the declaration there. Uh, what does the special rapporteur do? So, um, well, what we had to do first before we did anything was to find the legal basis or theory under which we will work because Human rights requires basically uh, state responsibility, international human rights. And so how are we going to face this kind of responsibility so that we would actually have to look at it? So would it be under a torture frame so that the individual criminal responsibility, that means the person who commits violence against women will be treated internationally as a torture perpetrator? That seemed less not difficult, but more a little more difficult to deal with. Or do we apply the equality frame that those who commit violence against women, let's see how others who commit other kinds of violence are being treated and let's compare and show that there is actually an inequality in the way women are treated before the law. But finally, everybody decided they would go in for due diligence. And that is basically to set up an accountability frame to say, we will measure what, what, what governments are doing 
in certain areas. And based on that report card, we will judge them. And so due diligence framework meant what are the laws they have in their books? What is the civil, uh, criminal justice system? What, what, how, how many cases are the prosecutors trained? How many uh, uh, convictions? How many, um, uh, uh, what, how have the judges ruled? What do the rulings say? What are the, then of course also the support services for the uh, victims. So we, we decided to do a accountability structure for the criminal justice system. Uh, so that was what the initial reports of the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women uh, put forward uh, and has, is still being used by rapporteurs. But the other thing is with regard to special rapporteurs is, I mean, you have three things you have to do. One is you are, you have to record an event. You are the witness. You're going to go and meet these people and you were promised to put their stories on paper. And this is a very serious thing. And also the ethics of it, when you do it, I find if you go immediately after a conflict, you get women who will talk to you honestly and sincerely. If you wait a little longer and you go, you begin to think they make, there's a little bit of coaching going on, it seems. And you know, so it's really important that the voice is authentic and to go to women immediately and talk to them as in, in their uh, immediacy uh, and record their problems. And they, they said, I remember this woman in who had suffered absolute most horrendous violence in Rwanda saying, take my story to, the, to Geneva. And she was very keen and uh, very careful and wanted it done and wanted it read. And she wanted to dot the I's and the T's as to what was going in the report. So there is that of, of reporting a case. The second aspect that you do is you engage with governments to get things done. Um, maybe encourage them to draft legislations and encourage them to do training programs, encourage them to do very specific support services for women victims of violence. You do all those aspects as well. And that's through engaging with the government. And uh, finally, um, you, you uh, have to, after doing all that, do the accountability report that you will finally write, write up as to what is going on, what are happening, what are the recommendations, how is the government performing, uh, etc. So that is what you do as part of your work. But of course, if you want to do a little extra work, is like following up on this, giving the NGOs and others who are in the country your report they can use to galvanize change as a way of, it becomes often uh, a basis for galvanizing change within the country, the report. It's happened in once or twice in my, uh, this thing. So there are other things you can do with your report once you've um, uh, set it in motion. And things do happen. Things do happen. I mean, we take Tokyo uh, and the comfort women. Uh, Hai Su Shi, who arrived within five days of my being made appointed, she arrived in Colombo and she wanted me to take the case of the comfort women because it was anniversary of World War II. And she showed me all the data and the facts and I studied it. And so I decided that would be my first case. So I went to Japan, North Korea, South Korea, met these women, the most very traumatic, who are now who are in their 60s and the 70s. And we pushed, and now J Japan would not mor accept moral responsibility, uh, accept legal responsibility. They said they're willing to accept moral responsibility. And through this moral responsibility, they set up a very, very large fund for these women to pay for them. But many of the women were not happy with that. They, didn't, they wanted it to be a legal responsibility and an act of, of, uh, of uh, acceptance of the responsibility. But at least some fund was set up, uh, not what everything that is wanted. So things do happen.
Thank you, Dr. Rodica. Um, we are now moving to, to another topic that we have been working on, but I, before that, because it is very connected to what you have done from your position on the special rapporteur and where we are moving um, now. And, 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 and perhaps that when we talk um, about the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, uh, something that has to do with the work you did uh, as a special rapporteur. Uh, but also how this war has been inspiring by the, all these international move, movements coming from all the regions, uh, from all over the, the world, and how they push forward this uh, legal framework, international standards, and actually setting the special rapporteur. So moving to, to another position and another work experience that that uh, you have, and I'm just talking specifically about the Security Council Resolution 1355 uh, on Women, Peace and Security, where you have the opportunity, as I mentioned when I introduced it uh, to the audience, um, you were the, the lead author of this global study on the implementation of this resolution. And I want to set this question also in the framework of the Colombian context. I am Colombian, as, as you might be aware, we are in a transitional uh, process. So this resolution to give a, a context to, to the audience is, is a landmark uh, resolution that reaffirmed the important uh, role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts, peace uh, building, peacekeeping and also the important role of women uh, during the past conflict uh, reconstruction. And this resolution stresses the importance of women equal participation and full involvement in all efforts in the maintenance and promotion of peace, uh, of peace and security. And I would like to ask you based on your own experience in, in the context of negotiation in peace processes and in transition from conflict to peace, uh, what do you think uh, uh, needs to be done to promote minimal participation of women? I ask that because today it seems, uh, especially in the UN framework, that gender, youth, and indigenous people are little boxes to, to tick for policy makers. Uh, in that respect, what do you think it needs to be done? And also because I see in my country that women are not really the, the face of this uh, process, or this transitional process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, it is a lot of it is tick a box now in international mediation, especially if the mediator is a UN official. There are a lot of things under the women section that he has to tick a box with. Um, but I mean, this women's participation has to be dealt with in, in, in a multi, in, at a multi-level uh, process. Um, you know, first you have to make sure that the mediator and the technical advisors themselves are aware uh, that the mediator is not woman. If he's not a woman, then that he would have a team which would be representative and would have women on that team. Um, and the friends, normally all these modern mediations have countries that are groups of friends and that, that these groups of friends would put pressure on uh, the mediator and the parties to the conflict to bring women uh, to the table. Uh, and I think to some extent, there has to be a parallel process always with where women run at their own process with regard to the, what they want on the agenda, what they need done, uh, that could feed into the main process, but which um, irons out some of the issues and which can be drawn on by the main process or back and forth. So there's some kind of connection between the women's issues and the parallel process and the women's issues in the main process. Um, but I think, uh, 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 this need for this watchdog, uh, women's 
um, process is very important if we're going to get the main process to actually move forward. But let us also be honest, we've seen Yemen, we've seen South Africa in Afghanistan, none of this is working very well, getting women to the table. Um, so in those contexts, we are still at a loss of words on what to do. Um, and um, I think uh, uh, basically UN and others have given up on trying. Uh, feeling peace is more important than women's rights. Um, and uh, we have to see whether that is a valid uh, conclusion to make and um, see how we can put the pressure on to have women at the table. In the end, they managed to get some women at the Afghan table, but uh, still it was not enough. Uh, but another issue also comes up, which is in South Asia, we find. Do we mean any woman at the table? Now, some of the women that have come to the table in South Asia are extreme reactionary, very nationalistic, very uh, violent, very, very difficult, where we would not want them for their values. So in that sense, do we have women involved, even if who they are go completely against the values that we believe in. And this is a difficult question, or do we advocate for them? And this sometimes becomes a difficult question uh, in these kinds of uh, uh, peace processes. So just to say this is a difficult area, especially in the Middle Eastern and other areas, a very difficult area, but I think you know, even if they don't do anything, the UN and others should have a constant parallel process to go through the motions, to go through the issues, to come up with ideas that maybe we can push in uh, from the side. If we can't get the, get them to get women into the into the original mainstream process. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumar Swami. And your answer leads me on to my next question, which is that there is this dichotomy that is created between cultural values of certain countries and um, the international human rights framework that advocates for women's rights, which is labeled by some as a liberal project that doesn't conform to certain local values. Um, do you think that this is a false dichotomy or is this friction actually real? And your answer leads me to believe that this friction actually affects the work on the ground? And if so, um, how do you, uh, like what kind of strategies do you use so that these international women's rights can um, be more harmonious and be cooperative with the laws and customs in the local context? Well, I think, this is one of the crucial questions of our times internationally now with Afghanistan. I mean, the problem of Afghanistan, how is anyone going to solve it in this area? Um, now we had a very interesting development in India in the 1990s and, and through it, Sri Lanka. We had um, a movement of feminists uh, based on CEDAW who pushed for a uniform civil code for India, that you wouldn't have religious, ethnic, any other different types of codes. You would have one code based on CEDAW. And uh, this was being pushed by everybody uh, who was involved in the women's movement. But then suddenly um, this pressure, which was mounting, was hijacked by the BJP and the RSS, which are the extreme right-wing parties in India. Uh, they decided that that would be their battle cry, one, one uniform civil code for the country, one country, one law. And uh, so basically, in a way, diminishing and um, erasing Muslim personal law from the face of India. So at that point, the feminists all withdrew. 
rather than get part of this, involved in this kind of dialogue and discourse and to be part of that uh, uh, trajectory. So you can, the point is that the equality for uh, personal laws and family laws and all can be weaponized against the Muslim community in certain contexts. Uh, and in South Asia, that's a serious issue. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Um, and you then also look at Afghanistan. There's no way that you can get up one morning and the Taliban will agree to a CEDAW, everything in CEDAW. That's just not gonna happen. So what we were thinking even with regard to India and Sri Lanka is that we would get Islamic scholars, women scholars, again with activists and just five or six basic women's rights demands that we will insist a minimum call that had to be adopted by all these groups if they want international recognition. Um, that that should be, there must be a minimum call. Now the discussion on the minimum call is not, is difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, it's basis on the two ideas everyone has agreed to is that the <coughs> core of law is around consent and around economic security. Those should be the ones that should be uh, protected. Anyway, these are going on now in South Asia, these discussions. Um, but I think the, in the West, the discussion is still get them to agree to everything. I don't know whether they will do that. I mean, especially when Saudi Arabia and Yemen and all these people don't have them either. So, so in that sense, uh, when we deal with these cultural laws, we um, have to decide which of these do we push for universal condemnation and which ones do we try and work with in a way that we can sort, sort it out in a way that the communities, that the women of the communities are happy uh, to, to, to be with it. I mean, they're, they're the final sort. I mean, now, for example, in Sri Lanka, there's this whole thing going on by Muslim Women's Marriage and Divorce Act. So the Muslim women have just said, they, don't, they, didn't, they didn't say re remove this act. They said, we want divorce, for the talak, which is the four divorces out. Uh, we want uh, child marriage out. Uh, there are four things, they can't remember all of them. That's all they wanted out. They were willing to go with the rest of the Muslim Women's Marriage Act. Um, uh, so even then it's having trouble, uh, but um, these are some of the things, discussions that are going on at the moment. Short of CEDO, should we make compromises? That's the first question everybody has to ask each, each other. Thank you. But I'm but sorry, there, I tell you. But there are certain things that I think we should, I wrote an article called Identity Within that was published. There are certain things, of course, that I don't think we should be asking for discussion, which is like those that involve extrajudicial killings, like honor killings and all those kinds of severe FGM. There's certain things that just like use cogent form of violence. Uh, and those, of course, I don't think we should be tampering around. But there are a whole host of laws relating to the community and functioning in the community where we may have to have a different approach. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. I, I would like to take it from here when, when we address about cultural identity and violence against uh, women. And I would like to address this question from the perspective of indigenous um, women. Um, the number of killings of human rights defenders has increased during the last five years. And 
a global witness reported uh, that in 2020, five out, out of the seven human rights defenders killed were indigenous uh, persons, which is a very large uh, number. Um, considering that we, we were, I mean, we're still at the middle of the pandemic. Uh, in response to, to this phenomenon, some countries have adopted um, some general mechanisms to protect those environmental and human rights uh, defenders. However, uh, those measures sometimes do not take into uh, consideration the cultural or special needs of the person. And I will hear uh, address from uh, the perspective of indigenous women, because in indigenous women, they engage in multi sides scenarios. They do not only attend the household, but they also actively participate within their community in the social, cultural, and spirit and spiritual matters. So when requires for, I mean, this context requires further efforts beyond assigning a security guard because that's the most common uh, measure that uh, states adopt when trying to protect the, the life of human rights defenders. And in this case of human uh, indigenous women rights, uh, human rights defender, how do you think it is possible to protect these indigenous women better, like taking into account their, their own cultural context? Well, I think the first thing, the best protection for indigenous women or any women who are under threat is a state that uh, does not give in to impunity, you know? So that if things are happening, that it immediately takes action and people who do these kinds of things are put in jail. That's asking too much, especially if they're complicit with the people who are actually doing the things. Um, so I think state mechanisms and state security guards are you know, very difficult. No, I mean, they're trained, I suppose, as guards, they're professionals, but having them around when you are a um, person who's uh, sort of comes from uh, a resistance background, it's very, very difficult on you and very difficult relationship. Um, so the other options, of course, is to have the community have a way of protecting you, but that men and women coming out of the community will give you that protection on a basis, there's an understanding. That would help. Uh, uh, and protect you and be with you wherever you went on a roster pro on a roster uh, process. The other option is, of course, is what was done in, in, and I think is still being done, the nonviolent peace force, uh, which was the, in Sri Lanka we had, which uh, if women were if human rights defenders were under threat, they were basically mainly northerner, but other parts of the world as well. Uh, and they would come and live with the human rights defender with all the access to information and security uh, from around the world and spend some time with them till uh, the security risk fades. And that did work in many cases. Um, so that's there, the nonviolent peace force kind of initiatives are, are, can be quite successful. Um, thank you, Dr. Kumaraswamy, for giving those very practical suggestions about how these uh, kind of protection measures are done on the ground. But um, I would like to move uh, the conversation a little bit in terms of um, the title of our series this year, which is Mother Mothers in Law. And this has a very intergenerational dimension to it in terms of how women's rights and empowerment of women have been passed on from one generation to another through mentorships and through inspiring um, uh, leading lawyers like yourself. And as you have mentioned, um, the nature of women's rights from the 80s and 90s when you started your work at um, the UN has shifted 
uh, greatly when we talk about the women's rights movement now. Um, for example, we see the fragmentation of the women's rights movement, uh, the intersectionality dialogues that have come up, and also different kinds of activism like the Me Too movement and how the feminist movement itself has been divided about how to approach certain topics. So um, my question to you is, um, how, how do you see how the feminist movement has evolved from the time the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women was adopted in 1979? And to what extent have these developments within the feminist movements challenged the UN framework of women's rights? Yes, this is a very important question. I think it's probably the question, the question of the women's move, international women's movement. Um, I mean, 1990s were the high point of the women's uh, international women's human rights. We, I mean, we had CEDAW from before, but we had this huge violence against women surge. We had um, the Rome Statute with comprehensive provisions uh, with regard to sexual violence. And we had the, the uh, Women, Peace and Security, 1325. All that happened in the 1990s and through to, uh, in the year 2000, of course, of Women, Peace and uh, Security. And uh, we also thought we were in perfect shape, but then major change. The first person to knock all of us off a uh, little is Judith Butler with her challenge of the word woman. She says woman should be de deconstructed. The gender is performative. Uh, there's no such thing as a category like women. Um, so that, of course, you know, this convention on the rights of the women that goes up for, for grabs. And then what does it mean? And how do we reinterpret it to be meaningful for all the other uh, communities that are affected? And in this process of trying to figure all this out, these are their terribly wrong, uh, vicious debates taking place between trans women and lesbian women and um, cis women and all going on at the moment, which are not at all helpful. Um, and I don't know how this will resolve. I don't think the countries of the UN, as I see them and know them, will take the word woman away and will not see it in any other way but as a biological where uh, at least for the next decade or so, to see it as a constructed gender performative identity, I don't see that coming to the UN. Um, but um, so then how do women's activists dealing with violence against women, how can we push maybe the CEDAW committee to slowly work some of these issues in? And one of the things they managed to do is just the acts of violence against these communities, trans communities or others is considered to be uh, a, a major violation and prohibited. Um, so there are slowly ways in which perhaps we can extend the protection of the women's, the word woman to all the other, um, other identities, but it'll take some time and some effective leadership to do that. The second uh, challenge is I think that this is linked to criminalization. You know, when I did, took this job and I began to, work, it took the due, due diligence framework as my work with the human rights, um, Nigel Rodley, who was probably none of, I don't know if any of you heard of him, but for us, he was the God of the law and, uh, uh, in terms of human rights. And he told me, don't do this. He said, you're going to go in partnership with the police system. The way you were framed it and the way the women's movement is framed it is that you will work with the police against the perpetrators. And the moment you do that, you will cr bring criminal law very closely, close to human rights. And that's an unhealthy framework. And so that's what has happened in many areas. Um, 
India, the rape case that was there in India, everybody was horrified. A lot of changes were asked to be made, but then we were all had to deal with provisions being brought for castration, for all, all kinds of uh, protections in the criminal law that we have fought for for other reasons to protect defendants being taken away. Uh, we've uh, seen uh, various things being brought in to protect women, but it has not been healthy, and especially when it uh, combines with the consent issue, which is that McKinnon, Catherine McKinnon framed for all of us the issue of uh, in trafficking, domestic violence, etc. The issue is that women is a victim, that she is, uh, oh, she was in a, in a situation of violence where she's exploited uh, and she has to be rescued. That is the frame that came in 1950s, 60s and 70s, uh, early 80s. And in reaction to that, there was a whole sex positivism movement that says no, women enjoy sex, women uh, um, are sex workers, there are right to sexual rights. We don't need to be criminalized and rescued. So that whole debate also exists. Um, and uh, so now the trafficking laws that are being passed get more and more punitive and criminalized. They criminalize the clients also now in Sweden and many other parts of the world. And at the same time, we're having very strong women's rights, sexual sex worker rights movements that are totally against that. So the movement is, so we're divided. We don't have a view or, I thought one of the things we have to do is get these schools together to find out that surely there must be something we can agree on, on this, uh, that there is, that it is non-consensual sex that we're talking about and slavery like sex. Um, so anyway, that too is an area. Then of course we have the whole issue of intersectionality, which is there's nothing in the whole convention on the elimination of discrimination that recognizes for a moment that a black woman or a woman of an upper class, lower class or a woman living in Asia geographically would have a different life or a different frame from those living in other parts of the world and require a different kind of assistance or analysis. So one of the important things in any future movement of CEDO is to bring intersectionality analysis into the way we operate CEDA, you know, in terms of how we um, analyze the provisions, how we um, uh, uh, do the research on outputs, uh, how we find how things impact on communities. So that whole issue of intersectionality is also uh, missing in CEDAW. So there's a lot of things. CEDAW, it's an interesting thing to write a paper, to write all this out. There's a lot of, lot of interesting things coming out about CEDAW um, that we need to uh, think about. Uh, but in a climate where everybody is uh, very, very, uh, very negative climate, Nobody wants to push for that world conference where such things can be sorted out. So I think we'd have to continue with these internal bickerings and discussions for a little while. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kumaraswamy. And um, our time is coming up for opening up the floor to questions, but just to end on a slightly more positive note, I would like to bring you um, bring back something that you said before about um, women being framed as victims in most of these debates, even in the uh, Rome Statute, where the focus is on crimes against women and the woman becomes um, the vic victim. Um, I would like to ask you from your own perspectives and experience of talking to women on the ground, um, whether you have witnessed stories of female empowerment 
um, through these types of experience of violence and discrimination, um, not to deny any of the importance of highlighting the victimization of women, all violence against women, but um, whether there's anything of, um, you know, to speak of survivors and even to speak of the story of Annie McDonald Langstaff, where we started this discussion, where although her story is about discrimination, it's also about inspiring others through her pers perseverance. So um, what would you like to say about that, given all your experience witnessing stories of women on the ground? Well, I'll just tell you one of the stories, which is a lady called, I'll call her Alice, that's not her name, from, from Rwanda. I went, I went three weeks after the Rwandan genocide to uh, Kigali and met this lady near Taba, where um, that famous place where this mayor was uh, inviting them, the, the Tutsi in and then getting the Kutu into Hamburg to come and do all sorts of things to them. Uh, uh, so um, Alice was actually living in her house in that uh, area when a whole group of uh, young men came into the house and they destroyed the house. They killed her, the males in the house. They raped her and they thought she was dead and her sister also, and they left. Uh, she then was okay a little bit, very, very badly wounded. Her neighbor took her to the hospital. In the hospital, they discovered that she's Tutsi. So then she was asked to leave the hospital. And she was then taken to the jungle where she basically lived with these injuries, having to eat, eat food and berries off the, off the trees. Um, and in fact, at the end, her hand had got gangrene and she had to actually physically remove her hand. Uh, so it was a, it's a good, grotesque story. And, but luckily, the RUF, when it was coming into Kigali, passed her and found her and saved her. So she was there. Now, when I met her, she had formed a woman's group and was busy empowering these women and trying to find a way forward, how to uh, get things done. She was very, very, very assertive, uh, wanting uh, the UN to help in this and that, very, not at all, uh, very confident. Uh, and um, she was a story of resilience come to life. I heard she got into the parliament. Uh, uh, so, so in that sense there, you, can, you can't get a more resilient story than that. Um, but um, at the same time, I must say that when I was there, I realized that the, the levels of men, we had to get in so many programs for mental health and others, because some women just didn't make it. They didn't do it. We, the problem with when we highlight all the time, the, you know, the great survivors, the great people who had got empowered, and that's wonderful, and that makes us feel good, we forget that many women don't make it uh, and uh, really have, have, a, have a very difficult time. And a lot of energy must be put for them as well uh, in that sense. Thank you. So as uh, Vishaka said, um, we're now going to move to opening up discussion and um, to members of our audience. And thank you all for being here. And I, I'm sure uh, that, uh, like me, you have found this dialogue really um, insightful and thought provoking and, um, and inspiring in many ways, uh, particularly in its um, combination of some, uh, and I think uh, Vishak and Luisa pointed this out, some, some kind of really concrete um, ideas and, and pieces of advice and reflections from past experience um, uh, to, to think about putting those into practice. Um, and at the same time, some, uh, you know, sustained theoretical questioning about um, the intersections of, of 
categories, of identities, of, um, of approaches that have, uh, have been highlighted through, through the dialogue. So I will, um, I will watch if you can use the little um, raised hand option that you will find under reactions on your screen that would that would help me um, turn to to people who might have uh, questions comments stories to share um, further invitations to uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy to share uh, share what I'm sure are hundreds thousands of stories uh, in your uh, in your back pocket. Um, would someone like to start off? Not I, ha I have many questions, but I will just okay. I'll ah, there we go. Okay, uh, Tanya uh, Monforte. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I I wanted to listen a little bit more, but I'll go ahead and get us started with the questions because I'm sure that it helps to get other people to ask questions. Um, I really wanted to follow up on Vishaka's uh, point where she asked about the question of culture, and one of the things that I'd always found um, really really interesting and amazing about your writing was the um, the ways in which you were able to bring both a global reach while still being contextual, <laughs> still being complex, showing the multiplicity of different um, situations and intersecting power dynamics and these sorts of things, um, while at the same time maintaining a, a strong voice of advocacy, which is not usually the case, I would say. I mean, I think it's unusual. I would say it's unusual. And so one of the questions that I, that I wanted to ask was, would you say that this is, that there's a, a methodological approach, an epistemic one, how is it, especially as we are dealing with so many um, difficult, complex issues on gender, uh, that you're able to still come up with, with lines such as, you know, that, that we have to allow women to have their rights in a manner that allows them to be full participants within their community um, is this, is there some, and it's not necessarily a formula, and I, I realize this is slightly unfair, but a way to approach these questions um, in a way that, that does allow for both of that, the complexity, the contextualization, and also still a global reach. Well, I think I come from a fortunate position in the sense that I spent the first half of my life uh, teaching jurisprudence, women's rights, all kinds of things in the academy, uh, and, and was closely tied to the academy. Uh, and then the second part of my life as a UN official going into the field and going through, especially in situations of armed conflict. So then, I, in fact, my last uh, speech, which I gave to lecture, I gave at the University of Edinburgh, I said, you know, I used to go from one to the other. I used to write, try to write an academic speech, or I would try to write a speech for the uh, general reader, etc. But I, I thought that the strength lay precisely at this intersection of someone who has had some kind of academic uh, training, but also has been so often in the field, and to see how to combine those views in a way that would be meaningful. So that's what it is been basically when I have a theory or when I have it, whether it triggers in me anecdotes and problems that I faced when I was in the field. Um, and when I'm in the field, there any theory that is, that is triggered. Um, so that's what I've tried to write and it's distinctive style to some extent. It's not people don't know where to put it but you know I think it has people find it interesting I guess some people I think many people <laughs> not just some people um, but but I think that uh, that that unique voice sometimes as, as you just mentioned it might be frustrating not to kind of um, you know, fit easily into the uh, in terms of readers or audiences, but but maybe that's exactly what you need. What we need to do, right, is is 
provoke those and, and question those barriers between those, uh, between those audiences. Uh, René Provo. Hi, Radhika. I, uh, I did, I did want to ask you? a question. Yes, just to say it's great to see you again. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, spending time. We could see through your window that it's late at night uh, where you are. And so thank you for staying up for, uh, for us. I, um, I, I was thinking, you know, uh, Luisa Vishaka with the questions sort of uh, took you over the arch of your career, kind of a decade of engagement in uh, uh, human rights generally and women's rights in particular. And I wanted to ask a question uh, about how this plays out on the ground in, in a concrete setting. Uh, and perhaps to um, put you on the spot a little bit uh, and ask you about Sri Lanka as an example uh, that you, you would know particularly well and I, I think I'm, I'm not putting you too much on the spot because I think you're, you're, you're pretty used to saying what you think. Um, but you know, has, has all this been transformative? Um, this huge push, you know, normatively, institutionally, uh, uh, the international community, how, you know, how much of a transformation does that produce on the ground? Is, <clears throat> is this a story of a, a changing discourse, but a largely unchanging practice? Um, or are there elements, in, when you think about women, uh, violence against women in Sri Lanka, to focus on that aspect in particular, are there aspects where you can say, well, you know, this has changed. This is really better than it was. And then perhaps some others where, you know, uh, uh, elements uh, all transformed, you know, Sri Lanka as, you know, a post-conflict country still today, uh, I think, uh, you know, 13 years after the, uh, the end of the war, a culturally diverse uh, country with, you know, Buddhist nationalism coming in to uh, play a role, a politically fragile country um, uh, these days, but also one with a sophisticated legal system. So what do you think? <laughs> well, that was... That's, I must think a little. Let me just say that what I feel in Sri Lanka is that um, with regard to violence against women, it is spiking. Um, nothing, we have not, in terms of institutions, we've gone nowhere. The head of police spokesman said that he has told all policemen uh, to take their, to not separate couples. If there is violence, they must be taken back to the husband and they must work with the husband and allow the marriage. Always family comes first. And then Buddhist monks putting up posters saying, put, it, put up with it for the sake of the children. All this is going on right at the moment. Um, so I don't, we have, basically I see in many parts of the third world now, two discourses emerging on women and many things. One is the discourse of humanism, discourse of lib liberal, social democratic, um, uh, which is there and in which most people in the cities uh, especially believe in, especially those with international and global connections through social media or real life. And then there is the populist uh, reaction, which is there in a lot of countries now, which sees violence against, does not see violence against women as an important issue, um, which basically has women relegated to their early positions in society, which, uh, so there is this confrontation taking place between these worldviews. Uh, in Sri Lanka, one world, uh, our worldview came up into, uh, was winning 2015 to 2020, and now it is losing uh, because the state has taken the other option. But there is always resistance. You know, when events take place, I find more and more, more women from different backgrounds are resisting. 
recently, just two days ago, uh, a member of parliament used some very vile language against women parliamentarians. And there's been a massive reaction, both from the parliamentarians and the public. So I think, you know, there is that resistance that's, that's there. But I think we have a real issue about different discourses, uh, which reflect different ways of perceiving women and dealing with women, dealing with violence, uh, existing side by side, and depending on the government and the uh, powers that be, which one is implemented. And at the moment, we have a government that sees violence against women in a shame context. It sees domestic violence as something that should be hidden. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's and uh, ma marriage is something that is sacrosanct. Um, so, so we don't have much going on in that area in Sri Lanka at the moment. Rape is a little better, uh, but still not very powerful. But there is a lot of activism among women's groups, but it's not being translated into it. Thank you. Looking for another uh, question. While I look, I I will jump in. Um, I think, as as you can imagine, um, and I and I think comes through in some of the responses that you gave in the in this conversation. Um, it is a, a challenge when across generations. When for some of us, the nineteen nineties are yesterday, and for some of us, right, uh, young jurists coming along, the 1990s feel like pretty old history. So mm -hmm. it's so there's a kind of reaction of, well, we don't really care about the 1990s, and and going back to the 1960s and 70s, that really sounds, I mean, truly, um, you know, so far back. And so there's this. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that that particular challenge, particularly for young jurists uh, listening, um, thinking about how they will combine advocacy and, and scholarly contributions, um, and about the possible ways in which we can draw on the past to, to not shape the future, but to at least inform the, the shaping of uh, the future that will indeed be in the hands of, of um, people younger, younger than we are. Are there some possibilities to, to, to turn some of the divisions that you talked about to, so eloquently about, and you touched on so many of them that we're aware of uh, across the world, is there a possibility of transforming some of those into a reimagined connection um, and uh, solidarity that, that doesn't leave women around the world who, who aren't following the latest, you know, theoretical, um, you know, disputes about about um, the the meaning of women, the possibility of solidarity among women, that doesn't leave them uh, leave them behind. Yeah, well, I think um, I think on, on this whole issue of women, gender, uh, and performance, you know, we have that requires a conversation that has to be had among women and sorted out before, before we move forward on the international uh, agenda or arena. I think that's very key and that that's done. Um, on the area of, cons and now the another thing is we have, everybody's uh, very hard-lined about things. Now this group that believes in prohibitive, punitive criminalization of, uh, of, of trafficking, prostitution are uh, completely refuse to talk in any way to those who want the rights of sex workers, rights of um, you know, women, sex positivism as it's called, uh, uh, and uh, consensus, 
we also put a great deal of emphasis on consensual sex. So that's another barrier that has to be broken. But I don't know if any of you have seen this book by Amya Srinivasan. It's been uh, shortlisted for the Booker. It's called The Right to Sex. She's, she's a professor. She took Isaiah Berlin's chair in, at Oxford. And, um, and she has an interest, I mean, she tries to resolve it. And she, what she says is, you know, it's true there's the McKinnon uh, kind of argument that uh, all sex, a lot of sex is uh, exploitative um, and makes women victims, uh, whether it's pornography or rape or domestic violence, and that there's no room to start imagining consent. And then we move into this era where everything is consent and people are negotiating their relationships. Uh, but what she argues is that actually consent is also structured. So that she talks about this young men who are, are they called intercell, intercells? These young men who the women, uh, they, he's called hot, she calls them hot blonde women reject. Incels. Incels. Yeah. And who feel, therefore, they have the right to kill them because they've been rejected by them. Uh, and, you know, how does one deal with that? And there's a whole website and groups that are on this basis. And that does everyone have a right to sex? And then if you look at it from that perspective, who is having sex in this country or any country? Uh, and who is happy with the sexual partners that they can choose? So who you choose and who you to have sex with and who you can have sex with is deeply structured. There's no, cho it's not choice. Um, this is, and Amya proves it. Uh, and um, so I, suppose I, I, I only said this to say that we have to find a middle between this free choice, free em em empowerment approach to sexuality and other things. And, and the other one, which is that everything is um, determined and structured and always deny you any kind of consensual freedom. Uh, but hopefully we can work toward all that. But I just wish we could work through all that without all this rancor and anger and viciousness. This, in, just a friend of mine made a state, which is my age, not very, uh, was not very smart and said something about uh, trans. She's just been trolled and attacked in the most vicious, absolutely vicious manner. Uh, and um, uh, so you can't, you can't have a conversation with that kind of approach to dialogue uh, in that sense. So something has to be, it can't be on social media, whatever dialogue we have, it'll have to be through uh, other forms of media, face-to-face -face meetings, those kinds of things, I think, in the end, if they're going to resolve these kinds of issues. But I think the feminist movement needs, needs to have, somebody has to sponsor inter-dialogues within the feminist movement, intergenerate. I had, uh, before, uh, before Paris, we had in South Asia, in my center, the International Center for Ethnic Studies, an intergenerational dialogue on the issues. It was the most fascinating meeting. They were in their 30s, the young ones, the others mainly in their 50s and 60s. And I really didn't think there would be any issue because my talking with them was such that they were all same, I thought, generally from the same perspective, but exactly on the issues we mentioned, on the issues of sex, on the issues of consent, on the issues of criminal. These are the issues. There was, there was very strong objection. Uh, thanks. Well, yes, as you can tell, I'm also a believer in intergenerational conversation and listening. And I think there are many challenges about um, about how 
how we listen and for what purposes and, and what are we trying to, to construct together. I'll just pass on in the last couple of minutes um, a question that came to me in the chat from, um, from Cassandra Naranjan, who says she's in a fairly noisy room, so it would be difficult to turn on her uh, microphone and ask it. Um, and she says, and I, I think I think you have actually addressed some of this, but if there's something um, distinctive to add, that would be great. She says she's curious uh, to learn more about your perspectives on so-called third world approaches to international law and their interaction with mainstream feminist discourses and how this influences uh, the global um, uh, uh, women's peace and security agenda and how do we nuance those perspectives for advancing women's rights in the context of debates that we've talked about in the conversation uh, this morning, this evening, uh, on cultural relativism and human rights. Yes, well, let me talk about North-South um, on women, peace. We'll begin with women, peace and security, because there is really a divide between North and South. And from when I did the global study and even now, uh, the Northern countries are very much moving the agenda. They move it along the lines first of sexual violence. Now it's on the line of representation, including representation in the military. Um, very much an agenda going that route. Southern, southern uh, consultations that we had with the global, um, uh, as part of the global study, they're not so happy about this complete obsession with the Security Council. Uh, and uh, they want to deal with the political economy of conflict. You know, how it affects their livelihoods, development, how we move on, peace building. Those are the issues that really they matter for them. So there is a, there is a difference in the way they look at human peace and security and uh, deeply skeptical of the Security Council framework. Um, so I think uh, also women's groups, women's uh, from uh, evolving out of the subaltern and other post-structural and post-modernist movements in which they're deeply skeptical of the international and the universal. Uh, you know, that whole generation was urged by their philosopher teachers to go local, study what's local, study what's relevant locally, uh, the difference. So they don't like general categories and working universally in international human rights or anything like that. Though I think the climate change movement will change that. I think that will force them back to having to deal with things that are international. And, and local. But also, of course, the issue of intersectionality and uh, in, a, in a much more uh, affirmative sense uh, in terms of imperialism, colonialism, and their impact on, on the world. You know, the, and, and, and a revival now more and more of Franz Fanon and his way of looking and analyzing things. I see that in every discipline now. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of his work which of course is, is not only material and economic, it's a political, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a, psych, it's a psychological uh, understanding of colonialism as well. Um, so yes, th th that's another area that we still need a lot of conversation about. You know, when we say women are united, it's not only those areas, but the area north south, there are differences, very strong differences uh, in opinion and how we how we uh, uh, move forward, and uh, in which institutions and which issues matter to you depends a lot on how where you come from. Yes, indeed. Well, with that, I. <laughs> I think people probably feel that we could continue this uh, dialogue for a very long time. And um, I'm sure or hope that this particular dialogue will inspire many more, many more conversations and dialogues in, in all of the corners 
in which we uh, work and, and live with others. So it just um, uh, remains uh, to thank uh, Vishaka and Luisa for leading uh, this dialogue, for engaging um, our guest, Pratika Kumaraswamy, in um, a wide ranging and, and uh, thought provoking uh, dialogue. Um, and uh, thank uh, Radhika for returning to our Faculty of Law, albeit virtually, <laughs> returning uh, to the Center for Human Rights, returning indeed to the Annie McDonald Langstaff workshop series, because I understand that, of course, you have, uh, you have been a speaker in this series um, in, in the past. Uh, so thank you so, so much. And uh, to all of you um, uh, in the room with us, a little reminder, um, to keep your eyes open for publicity for the winter workshops uh, in January, Wednesday, January 26th um, with Esmeralda Thornhill uh, and then another one in March. Um, and our winter guests, interestingly, are also repeat visitors uh, and teachers uh, who know our faculty and, uh, and uh, Center for Human Rights very well. So with that, thank you so much to everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of the uh, morning or the rest of the late evening, depending on, uh, uh, on where you are. And, um, and we will see you again for the third workshop in January. Thanks.